when you come into the exhibit, you have an opportunity to really enter the fascinating world of bones. A forensic anthropologist works with law enforcement in the identification of human skeletons. These are cases where you can't use traditional criteria to identify the person. You can't use their facial appearance or tattoos or fingerprints. You're looking at either a skeleton or badly decomposed remains. And just like you read a book, I can read a skeleton in the sense that we can determine the person's age, sex, much about them that is working toward, in a forensic case, establishing who that person is and their cause of death. Bones are a great equalizer in the sense that everyone has a skeleton, and with that, we can examine and learn about what their personal story was, what their life was like. Events that occurred to them in life as registered in the skeleton, and in the same sense, much about what was responsible for their death. So whether that person was alive two weeks or four months ago, or whether that person was alive hundreds of years ago. We follow these back in time and we look at it as a way of presenting the information as essentially a cold case, a forensic cold case. And in doing this, one of the individuals that you will see the remains of is that of Captain Bartholomew Gosnold. Gosnold is one of America's great greats and yet nobody really knows him. If you say, I'm going to Martha's Vineyard, you're literally talking his daughter Martha. He is credited with the discovery of Cape Cod. He, is a, he was a lawyer, he's a very high status gentleman, and he was responsible for obtaining the charter that allowed the Virginia Company to form. And so he's very important, but he came over to this country and in three weeks later died. Another very special case that I want you to come look at is that of one of the boys at Jamestown. We have two brief records in diaries that mention that there was an Indian attack just about two weeks after they had come to the island and that several men were injured, but a boy died. Two of the 1607 colonists mentioned that. And in looking at the remains of this individual, this is probably that person. And when we excavated this burial, it's one of those burials that you just have to excavate and see it actually to believe it, but embedded in what would have been his thigh muscle, he has an arrowhead, a projectile point. But the story doesn't end there in the sense that when you're looking and reconstructing what his life was like in 1607, one of the things that you realize is that he was very sick. He had, shortly before he got on the vessel, and it was a five-month voyage to come over, sometime shortly before that, something had clipped him in the mouth, and in doing that, it had fractured two of his teeth. In fracturing those teeth, those front central incisors, one of them, it broke completely in half. And in breaking it completely in half, it exposed the pulp chamber. And with that pulp chamber exposed, it allows bacteria to get inside to start up an abscess. Now this is an abscess that is unlike many in the sense that it really is a virulent infection. He would have been in dire straits in the sense that these teeth in front are held in just simply by gum tissue. It's amazing out of sheer frustration that he just didn't reach in there and pluck them out, but he didn't. They're held in by gum tissue. He would have had all kinds of draining infection coming out. He would have been, every breath, he would have been bringing this infection back into his mouth, into his lungs, that area. So he's truly in trouble. And this would have been so painful, he would not have been eating well. So in doing a reconstruction of him, one of the things that we capture is his youth, but also the terrible condition that he's in. He's one of these, individuals who has totally been left out of the record except for what we can tell in terms of his story by examining the human skeleton. The skeleton provides a fascinating glimpse, a very intimate glimpse as to what lives were like of our ancestors some three to four hundred years ago. Most people are getting their information on forensic anthropology and CSI and forensics and all this from, from these different crime scene shows. And one of the things that when you're in the field and you watch these, you're often quite uh, um, you know, a little hard to take because sometimes they're very misleading. Sometimes they are inaccurate in the information. And yet what we can tell is amazing. And one of the very special components that we have is at the very end of the exhibit, we have a forensic anthropology lab. And it is a true lab that is equipped with a wonderful microscope, cases that include both actual bones as well as teaching casts and it has different exercises that students and their teachers can come and work on. We have not yet begun to understand the secrets that are hidden in the human skeleton and my hope for the future is that this next generation of students, these students that we reach out to, that we expose to this field, they will have a better understanding of it 
And in the same sense, some of them may go into this field and they will be able to answer questions that we haven't thought about today. The sky is the limit in this field and there's room for good people.